My name is Amanda Vigar. I'm the Vice Chairman or Deputy Chairman of Vote Leader in Yorkshire. And I also write and blog and tweet as the business battle axe. And I've got the job this evening of keeping this rabble under control. Over the last few weeks, we've gone from a standing start when David Cameron first announced the date of the referendum. And over those last few weeks, there have been millions and millions of leaflets. God knows how many meetings taking place from a standing start. And also thanks to the volunteers that have been helping. So I'd like just everybody to thank those volunteers. And thank you to everybody for telling their friends, for delivering leaflets. And just carry on, we've got another 68 days. And to use the words of Tony Blair, which I don't often, you know, we've got 68 days to save the UK from a terrible future within the UK. So we've got four to six odd million voters to get that message to and make sure that on June the 23rd they go out and vote to leave the EU. So tonight's the start in Leeds and I'd like to hand over to the Chairman of Britain for Business in Yorkshire and Humber, Carl Chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you, as Amanda says, for turning out tonight. It's great to see that so many people around the country today. There have been thousands of volunteers manning stands, giving out leaflets, getting people to sign up. I'm here as Chairman of uh, Business for Britain to explain to you a little bit about why I got involved in this campaign and why I'm trying to get the business view out into the, into the whole argument. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've been in business in Yorkshire now for about 20 years. I was one of the founding directors of a business called Spice, which we grew from a startup in 1996 to a FTSE 250 business, turning over about 400 million pounds, employing about 4,000 people. I'm currently chairman of a gas supply business in Harrogate, and I'm on the board of the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust. So the business background, I suppose you'll expect me to say, start off by saying to you tonight, why I think we should leave the EU from a business point of view. Well, I will. I'll come on to that in a second. Because my main reason for wanting to leave the EU is actually something more fundamental than the economic argument. And it's a really visceral point to me, because I think I've got a very valuable possession. It's a possession that people have killed for. It's a possession that people have died for. It's the power that I give to politicians every four or five years. In fact, I lend them that power to sit in government and to pass laws and regulations which affect what I do and what my businesses do in this country. And every four or five years I expect that politician to come back to me and to say to me, I want you to trust me with that power again for another four or five years. That is a very valuable possession. And it beggars belief, as far as I'm concerned, that we've allowed a situation to develop in this country where we've allowed politicians to give away 60% of those powers to institutions in another country which are largely unrepresentative of us, largely unelected, and totally unaccountable as far as I'm concerned. I'm talking about European Commission, the main law initiating body in the EU. 28 unelected people whose sole criteria for being there seems to be that they failed to justify election in their electri being elected in their own country. <laughs> a council where every time the UK has tried to oppose a measure which was against the UK's interests, we've been outvoted over 70 times. And a parliament where on those occasions when UK MEPs get together to oppose measures which are against us, against our interests, 
they're outvoted 80% of the time. And as if that wasn't enough that we've given away that control, we're paying a small bloody fortune for the privilege. Every week we send across £350 million pounds to the EU. To put it in context, in Yorkshire, about £1.1 billion pounds a year. Now, £1.1 billion, pounds, that's enough in Yorkshire to build four hospitals. It's about 24 times what we normally spend on flood defences in this area. And we all know the effect that that's had, both in terms of personal impact and financial impact in this area. And that's the direct cost. On top of that, we've got regulations. Regulations which affect every single business in this country, regardless of whether they deal with the EU or not. And the fact is that only 5% of businesses in this country sell into the EU. But every single one of them has to comply with the regulations. And the benefits that are talked about that we get, the benefits in terms of trade, being in the EU, we double our trade with each other. If only that were the case. We're part of a trading bloc which had seen its share of global domestic product shrink from about 45% down to currently below 20% and moving downwards. We're in a trading bloc where our, share, our percentage of our exports going to the EU has gone from 55% to below 45% and going downwards. We're in a trading bloc where we've allowed the EU to negotiate trade deals on our behalf for 42 years. And what have they achieved? They've achieved agreements with about 55 countries with a GDP of about seven or eight trillion dollars. Korea, Chile, Singapore, Switzerland, four countries <coughs> on their own outside of trading blocks have secured trading agreements with countries around the world with four and five times that gross domestic product. The EU has failed completely to address our need as a trading nation, as an entrepreneurial nation, to deal with the rest of the world. And even within the EU, we have failed to export in the way that we should have done into the EU for a number of reasons. And if you look at countries outside of the EU, not only not part of the EU, but not even with trading agreements, the United States, Canada, Australia, they have all doubled their exports to the EU, grown twice as quickly as we have. So the business case for standing, say, in the EU just does not exist. And more disturbingly for me, whatever people say, a vote to remain in the EU is not a vote for things to stay the same. We are going to be one of two countries that are either not in or not obliged to join the Euro. We are going to see over the next five to ten years a situation where they, the rest of the members of the Eurozone will completely, sorry, will consistently vote in favour of measures which protect the Eurozone. We will be sitting on the sidelines, we'll be a helpless participant in a trading bloc that's declining. But if we leave, we can go and enter into trade agreements with all of these countries around the world. It won't be easy, but it'll, it's going to happen. We are an innovative trading nation. Our future lies trading with the rest of the world. The EU was a concept of the 1950s and the 1960s, and it stuck in the 1950s and the 1960s. The rest of the world has moved on. And I want to vote to leave the EU because I want to be part of the world that's moving on. Part of the world that is growing and part of the world that is exciting. Those are the reasons why I'll be voting to leave the EU on June the 23rd, and I hope you will too. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. I'm honoured and delighted to be introducing someone, someone inspirational. Someone who undoubtedly leaves little introduction to you today. Every single one of us in here has our own reasons, our own explanations, our own story about why we are going to be voting leave on June the 23rd. It could be down to sovereignty, it could be down to opportunity, it could be down to finance, it could be down to the red tape, amongst many others. 
My name is Halsa Rutkoll. I'm a mathematician and as a proud and passionate supporter of Vote Leave, I'd like to just take a few moments to share my story. I believe in a global, humane and fair response to immigration. I believe that it's unjust and even heartbreaking that the EU doesn't allow us to do that. My grandfather, like many of your parents and grandparents, came here in 1963 from India for a better life for not just himself, for his family. The Britain he found gave him a fair day's work for a fair day's wage. The Britain he found became his home, his life. It gave him the opportunity to own his own business and contribute back to society. The Britain he found allowed him to follow his faith without prejudice or discrimination. It allowed him to keep his Sikh identity while integrating into British life. The Britain he found gave him higher hopes for his children and now my generation, his grandchildren. So we didn't have to decide between work and study at a young age so that the girls could have the same opportunities as the boys. So that we could go to school, we could get educated and we could reach our potential. Being part of the EU allows EU citizens to come here, not based on their skills or education or what they can contribute, but based on where they were born. I believe we need a global view to immigration. We want the best doctors, the best teachers, the best refuge collectors, the best cleaners, the best shopkeepers, the best entrepreneurs to come to Britain, to allow Britain to flourish and be greater still. We shouldn't be discriminating against based on where people were born, or what colour their passport is, or even their skin. If we vote leave on June the 23rd, we will leave the European Union, but we will join the world. I'd now like to introduce someone who believe strongly in teamwork and doing things together when we can. Believe we can join the biggest team in the world, the whole world. So I'm proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with him for the next 68 days to vote leave, to take back control. He's known by many names. The Mayor of London, Bojo, the one man melting pot, a buzzer, but of course to us, Boris. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Boris Johnson. has been engaged, and when you think back to the history of the 20th century, for instance, in which British armed forces were engaged uh, with the huge sacrifice, what was the one thing we were fighting for? What was it all about? Can everyone know what it was? It was about democracy and freedom in Europe, wasn't it? It was about democracy, and that is effectively what we are fighting for again today. And I have to say, I'll give you an, an example of, of how, it's, how it works in my life. Well, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Mayor of London, by the way, and they've unleashed me for the, for, the, for, the, for the afternoon to come talk to you. And uh, I can tell you that being Mayor of London is, is a lot of direct interaction with the electorate of London. I cycle around the whole time, uh, you know, I, I meet all sorts of people and they shout out jovial greetings at me like <laughs> Tory Tosser. <laughs> Like that, or some of them say slightly more complimentary things sometimes. Uh, but they all know, every single bird, everybody I meet in the streets knows roughly what I do. They know roughly who I am. They know that I'm in charge of the fares on their public transport. They know that I'm responsible for the cycle super highways, for instance. They know that I'm in charge of the Metropolitan Police Force. They know that I'm in charge of planning in London. And they know how they can get rid of me at an election. And let me ask you, do we, does any of us know 
who is in charge of the great torrent of European regulation and legislation that comes into this country? No, we don't. No, we don't. And that is the problem that we face today. I, I just want you to imagine, just imagine for a second that the European Union has never existed, right? Just imagine. And the first of all, it says that there's never been those very brilliant French bureaucrats who decided they were going to, in a spirit of idealism, they were going to create this system of trying to lock Germany in by creating this federal structure with a supranational commission, a European court, and all the rest of it. And suppose, instead, that the history of Europe was a story of gradually strengthening, growing economic interpenetration based on trade and friendship and intermarriage and all the rest of it. All of, it, all of it, of course, guaranteed by the NATO security umbrella, as it, it has been. Now imagine if, that, if, it, if it worked that way. And uh, the continents have gone through a period of long peace and prosperity, but without an EU. And then suddenly, 2016, someone came to us today and they said, Bonjour. <laughs> uh, we've got this brilliant idea for a new project to take all these higgledy-piggledy untidy nations and, and meld them together into a single political unit with a single currency and gradually working towards a single system of government and you Brits will have to sign up to every single bit of it except for the single currency at least at first and one way or another, from the word go, Brussels, as we've, as we've just heard, Brussels will be responsible before between half and two thirds of all the legislation passing through the Palace of Westminster, 2,500 a year, costing British business about 600 billion pounds a week, telling us you can't have olive oil in cans of more than five liters, and you can't sell bananas with an abnormal curvature of the fingers, and you can't have vacuum cleaners of excessive power, my friends. I don't know what they've got wrong against British vacuum cleaners, but I think, well, I mean, I mean, of course, vacuum cleaners, if you're cautiously used, can cause all sorts of injuries. <laughs> but it should be up to us. It should be up to us in this country. To the side. Decide the subtle power of our vacuum We have plenty of officials in the Department of Trading Stands and Business Engineering Skills who consecrated their lives to the study of electric appliances. We should, we should be able to settle these, settle these matters uh, our, ourselves. But they, they say, oh no, oh no, you, you've got to come sign up to all that stuff and this is the, the offer. You've got, to, uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to abandon control of your borders. And you'll have. Massive net immigration is going to put unexpected pressures on all the services provided by local government, not to speak, of course, of the pressures on the health service. And at this point, you're starting, you're starting, you're starting to feel a bit you know, uneasy about this club, quite frankly. And you're looking a bit pale. You're thinking, well, you know, what's, what's you know, did you have a really want to and, then, and then they say, and it's going to get worse as soon as you join, because this single currency that we mentioned earlier on is, uh, is unfortunately turning out to be a complete disaster and it's been decided that the only way to save the single currency is to create a, uh, a very very tight fiscal and, and political union binding these countries even more intensively together in a way that frankly compromises the whole of uh, their independence further and will inevitably implicate the United Kingdom through the single market. That's how we intend to do it. And you look at the, the, the people offering you membership of this club on these terms, and you say, well, it sounds totally deranged. <laughs> Why would anybody, and you say, well, how much will you pay us? How much will you pay us to join this club? Uh, you say, they say, they say, me not. <laughs> me not. We don't pay you. Uh, you pay us. <laughs> you pay us £20 billion pounds a year, and half of it uh, we give you back to spend in your own country, or rather we in Brussels, unelected EU bureaucrats, decide how that money will be spent in your own country, and uh, the rest of that money, well, it, uh, it just disappears. The white blue yonder, I think. And uh, some of it, of course, goes into the common agricultural policy, a demented 
system that discriminates brutally against third world producers, burdens farmers with all sorts of unnecessary bureaucracy. I'm, my family used to uh, be, be hill farmers, we were very unsuccessful, I have to say. Uh, we, 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 went, we went bust, but, but uh, in, in about 1969. But many, many, many of you, know, anybody who's familiar with, with agriculture will know that uh, all kinds of farmers in this country are absolutely belaboured with bureaucracy and regulation. I mean, there was something called uh, the animal, when, when sheep died on our farm, basically, uh, as, they, as they often did. Uh, <laughs> anybody will know who farms sheep on a hill farm, there's nothing much you can do to stop them dying. And they die all over the place. They die in the, in the, in the ditches and in up the trees, and, and, and they basically just disintegrate. But there was a, an EU directive that came out called the Animal Hygiene Directive, which said you basically couldn't allow that to happen. And you had to, you had to bury an animal on your own farm. And it, it just strikes me as being absolutely inappropriate for uh, our agriculture. And, and the whole system, of the of the CAP is basically is adding about 400 pounds a year uh, to the cost of food in this country. The rest of of the cash, the rest of the cash, is of course going off to uh, heaven knows what Potemkin olive groves in in Greece or, or tobacco subsidies in in, uh, in Italy, literally going up in smoke. Uh, our money is and and and. I hesitate to say this, in a way that is borderline corrupt. Borderline corrupt. Ten billion pounds of it absolutely disappearing. And the Court of Auditors, the European Court of Auditors, has not signed off the accounts of this spending for 20 years. Yes. So that's the offer. That's, that's the offer. For, that's the club that we're being invited to join in this imaginary situation. A club that wastes prodigious quantities of our money, that destroys democracy in this country, and all for no real economic benefits for Britain. Now, let me ask you, if that was the offer, would you join such a club today? No! Absolutely not. We'd be out of our minds. No one would join it. Of course we wouldn't. The whole thing is a complete anachronism. The EU may have been a good idea. It may have sounded like the right thing to do in the 1950s, in the immediate aftermath of that terrible war, but there's nowhere else in the early 21st century, nowhere else around the world, is imitating this system of trying to meld countries together and creating a federal structure with a supranational system of legislation. Mercosur, all of trading agreements around the world, none of them do. Mercosur, ASEAN, NAFTA, None of them do it. And by the way, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to, uh, to, to, to President Obama about this matter. Uh, if, a, if and when America, the United States of America, decided it's going to subordinate its own legislature to Mexico and Canada and the organization of American states, would they dream of it? No. Of course I <laughs> you know, Of course. There are, President Obama is one of a, a, a large number of people who, who say we have you know, little choice but to remain, and effectively that we don't have the guts to leave. And they're shamefully now spending £9.3 million pounds of taxpayers' money or in their attempt to scare everybody with this leaflet, amongst whose many defects, as, as Nigel Adams has recently pointed out, amongst whose many defects uh, is, is that it is not sufficiently absorbent for the purposes that most people want to want to use it. And I think, I think they, are, they are in their condescension and in their scarce tactics and their, their whole project fear. They are woefully underestimating the spirit of the people of this country and what we know that we can do. And by the way, many of them are the very same people who said 12 or 13 years ago that we would have to join the Euro. Yeah. Remember all that? They said it would be an economic disaster. Yeah, yeah. An economic disaster, they said. The CBI, Mandelson, the lot of them. They said it would be an economic disaster if we didn't join the Euro. And then we stayed out of that. And, of course, it's precisely because we didn't believe the doom-mongering then, but because we stayed out of the Euro, that we had one of the strongest, most dynamic economies in Europe. And if you, if you want proof of, uh, of the 
the wisdom of that decision. Look at uh, what's happening, for instance, to the Nissan factory in Sutherland, where you know the, the, the not only has Carlos Ghosn uh, himself said that it makes not a bean of difference to him whether Britain is in or out, he will continue to regard this country as a fantastic place to invest, but they are actually adding plants, they are adding capital, they are investing in this country because we are now planning, or that factory is now planning, to export motor vehicles made in the UK to America. Isn't that fantastic? And, and there is another country, there, there were some people who were persuaded that it was absolutely essential for them to join the Euro, for instance, the Italians, and I have a great deal of sympathy now for Italy because they're going through a wretched time. They've got uh, very low growth, they've got a huge banking crisis unfolding, and they've seen, you know, the absolute virtual demolition of their motor manufacturing sector. Because their, their, their car manufacturers cannot compete in the Euro with Germany. And look at what has happened. I'm afraid the result is that that Nissan factory in Sunderland is now producing more cars than the whole of Italy. And that is the, that is the proof, if you want it, that the boosters were wrong. That the boosters were wrong in their, in their analysis. And sometimes, you know, when I, when I hear that if we, if we fail to, if we, if we, if we don't uh, stay in the EU, that the, what do they say, that the pound will fall, interest rates will rise, and there'll be a great moraine on our cattle and a plague of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> all those great problems. Although, actually, well, we've got plenty of, of, of uh, wonderful French people in London uh, already. <laughs> and and, and uh, all the money, and they will continue to be there. They will continue to be there after, after we have left. Well, I want to listen to these prophets of doom. You know what they remind me of? They remind me of the, of the people who said that the Millennium Bug would cause planes to fall from the sky. They're completely, they're completely wrong. They were wrong then, they were wrong about the Euro, and they are wrong today, my friends. They are wrong today. If we, if, we, if we believe in ourselves, if we believe in ourselves, and believe in what we burst out of the shackles of Brussels will immediately be able to do so some of those free trade deals around the world. Beginning, intensifying our relations with all those countries where I have fantastic fond memories of the UK. I cannot understand why in the 1970s we turned our backs and with other new growth economies around the world, with America, with China, with all the developing areas of the global economy. That is the opportunity uh, for this country. And, and the opportunity is for us in the UK, for UK officials, to do those deals and to take charge. Because one of the amazing things is that all our international trade all the responsibility for that is given over to the European Commission. Isn't that an amazing thing? We have no power to do trade deals, whatever, on our own behalf. And yet, only 3.6% of the European Commission officials come from this country. How on earth can we be confident that they will understand the needs, the requirements of British manufacturing and business and industry. And I think we should have the self-confidence to take back control of our destiny. If we do that, we'll get back control over our borders. And above all, to get back to the point with which I began, and which is the central point, and the point that drives me in this whole debate, we will give back the power to the British people to elect the people who take the crucial decisions in their lives and to remove them at elections. And that is absolutely <laughs> I think after, after we've done that, I think that this country will go forward with a fantastic seizing of opportunities that have absolutely nothing to do Commercial trade opportunities have nothing to do 
with the EU and our membership of the EU whatsoever. I, think, I don't think people realise uh, quite how uh, successful the modern UK economy is in all the 21st century areas. We really do lead the world in finance, in universities, in higher education, in media, in tech. All that stuff is now booming. For the 40 biggest tech companies in Europe, worth more than a billion dollars, 17 of them come from this country. It's a quite astonishing success. And that is the, the, that is the, the, growth, the growth areas of the future. But it's also true that we export all kinds of stuff that we make in this country. And it's still, we're still an astonishing, we're still an astonishing manufacturing economy, the fifth biggest in the world. And we export, I'm proud to say, bicycles <laughs> made in London, as it happens, but never mind. Uh, we export bicycles to well, it's Germany, Japan, uh, you name it. We export tea. Yep, tea. Of course we do. To China. Uh, we, export, we export rice. To, it's actually true. We export rice to India. We export TV aerials to Korea. We export chocolate cake, my friends. And ever, ever growing quantities of a completely dense and glutinous type of chocolate gato. We export to where? De France. We do. And I'm delighted to say uh, I have maybe discovered that we export ever growing quantities of French knickers to France. <laughs> we do. They're, 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 I don't, they're, 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 these French knickers, they are, they are, some of them I think are, are sewed in, in Wales, but the intellectual property residing in those French knickers or, or whatever they are, is, is of course ours. Uh, is, is, if there is intellectual property in that's of course there, there is. It, it emanates from this country, and, and it, uh, the profits accrue to this country. And let me ask all the economists here in the room, you know, do you really imagine that the French, post-Brexit, are the French are going to put tariffs on our cake, no matter how indignant they may be about having to buy our wonderful chocolate cake? Are they going to put, no matter how unsettling the French knicker manufacturers may find it when they go down the Champs-Élysées and they see British French knickers in their shops. Are they going to put tariffs on our British French knickers in France when we buy so much of their cheese and so much of their champagne? Of course they're not. Are the Germans going to put tariffs on Nissan's made in, in Sunderland when we import so many BMWs? Of course they're not going to. Are they going to discriminate against UK financial services when they have an 80 billion pound trade surplus with us? Of course they are not going to. And so I feel it's time to say, and you know I'm going to say this anyway, folks, it's time to say knickers to the pessimists. <laughs> knickers to the pessimists and to the merchants. And good for Europe. And, and showing a, and it, because really there are, there are now millions of people around the whole of the Europe, tens, perhaps hundreds of millions, who agree with us, who are fed up with the way Brussels is going, fed up with the unelected remote system of government. And we will be speaking up for them. We will be speaking up for them and showing that it's time for the whole European continent to bust out of this mentality to get rid of so much of the bureaucracy and to think global. This is our chance to take our economy global and to look at opportunities that are growing in a way that is more exciting than ever before. And if we hold our nerve and we're not timid and we're not cowed by these gloomadon popping leaflets that are funded with our own money and we vote for freedom and for democracy, on June the 23rd, that I believe this country will thrive and prosper and flourish as never before. With every week that passes, the Remainers, the Remainers get more and more rattled because it is more and more obvious that our side, our side is winning 
the argument. So I urge you all to get out there and campaign for this great movement for liberation, for freedom, for democracy. Campaign for it right up for the next 68 days until June the 23rd. And then let's hope June the 24th is Independence Day for our country. to create a better Britain in a better Europe. Thank you very much. that protects human rights, that protects workers' rights, is at risk of being repealed. So my question to you is, one, how do we address those concerns? Yes. And two, should we be concerned? No. I, I understand the concern. I understand what the Labour Party in particular is trying to say about all that, but it's absolute nonsense. We, who drafted? It was Winston Churchill who actually produced the uh, European Convention. It was his government that produced the European Convention on Human Rights. We pioneered the idea of, of human rights in the European Union, in, in Europe, we just don't think it's right, and I don't think it's right, that it's now the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which should be adjudicating on things to do with trade and the internal market, now has responsibility for all 55 articles of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. That is, in my view, completely inappropriate for the EU to be, and we were told in, by the Blair government in 2009, you may remember, but we had an opt out from all the brother, this would never happen. And they said that the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights had no more legal force than the Wiener magazine. And an absolute, <laughs> turns out to be complete, absolute nonsense. And uh, I don't think it's right that the, the ECJ should be uh, interfering in that way. And as for uh, people's anxieties about what a future Conservative government might do outside uh, the EU, for instance, with the NHS or, or public spending or, or, or whatever, and that these are the points that the, the Labour Party is, is making. Don't forget, don't forget that we will get back not only the £10 billion that they are currently spending on our behalf in this country, we'll get back a net an extra £10 billion which can be used on great projects such as the NHS or whatever it happens to be. And so actually, there'll be more scope to protect and support our public services. More scope, by the way, one of the greatest pressures on the NHS, as everybody knows, is, and I've talked to doctors and to people running A&Es in my part of the world, in London, and it's absolutely true everywhere, is, is caused by uncontrolled and unexpected levels of EU immigration, uh, which puts huge pressure on services in a way that they, they weren't able to predict. And yet, our immigration policy does not allow us to hire the kind of people that we might need to help run the NHS. And so you've got a completely crazy system. What we need to do, someone was waving the, that's it. We need to take back control. Take back control and make the British public Make, the, make British politicians finally accountable to the British public for what is happening in this country, rather than give, endlessly giving them the, the get out of putting their hands in the air and saying, not me, Gov, it's all being done by Brussels. It's not good enough, and we, should, uh, we will benefit massively from doing that. We'll have more money, and we'll have more control over immigration as well. That's what we need. No, I asked quite a 
minute. Have I really? Yes, you could be having one When's minute. When's my train? I, 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 want to, I feel minute. very guilty. I spoke for too long. I'll, try, I'll give very short answers. I'll answer some more questions. <laughs> Um, I think the main advantage that the Remain side has is that the undecideds might swing to Remain out of fear of change. So how best can we prevent against that? Uh, simply by showing that we have, we've got to do reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. They're trying to scare the, scare the, scare the, I was going to say scare the pants on everybody, but I talked to them about pants. Uh, they, 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 they're, they're, trying, they're trying to frighten people. It's totally wrong. I think it's unnecessary. It was only a few months ago that the Prime Minister was telling us that Britain would thrive outside the EU. Why? What, what suddenly changed in the, in the story? It's absolute nonsense. And, and by the way, all those who prophesy uh, doom today, the same as you prophesied uh, doom a long time ago. We have, in our campaign, we have a huge advantage. Uh, we know more about it, broadly speaking, and we are passionate, and uh, we are mobilised. And when I look at the numbers of people turning out to support vote leave stalls and vote leave meetings, it is huge by comparison uh, with the Remain camp. The, the trouble with the Remain camp is they don't really believe in their own case, isn't it? You can tell. You can tell, as I, as I said yesterday, there's an element of, of Gerald Ratner, I'm afraid, about, uh, about, their, uh, about their approach. Yeah, I definitely... They don't understand that, that's quite true, I'm afraid that's true. Yes, the gentleman there. Oh, sorry. Go on, I'm trying to take, I'm trying to take one of you. Hi, you said yes. it. You I'm, said I'm it. probably one of the very few uh, Green Party supporters here. It Yay. seems to me Hello. that a lot of the votes that are yet to be won, the swing votes, are going to be on the left, Yes. they're going to be Greens, they're going to be Liberals in Scotland. They're going to be SNP supporters. How do we reach those people? Well, let me give you one example. For I'm, I'm a passionate environmentalist. I believe I believe in in trying to endangered species, for instance. So everybody, everybody in this country cares deeply about. Uh, I, I've just been told that uh, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, which we all uh, support, the EU. This is why it's such an illusion to think that we have more influence within the EU. On the contrary, the EU wants to take over the UK seat on CITES so that we lose our voice. And the same is, you can see the same thing happening in the WTO, in the G7, the G20. The EU constantly wants to push Britain aside. The, the paradox of this whole argument is we would gain more influence if we got out of the EU rather than being part of this pantomime voice. Pantomime Last question for you, sir. Last question for you, sir. Uh, I agree entirely with everything you said. Uh, there is nothing like driving a BMW, eating a French gatto, wearing a pair of French boots. You can be in the Vino, that's even better. However, one thing that does concern me is, being of an age, I remember what Britain was like, and indeed how hopefully it can be like again. There is a large number of young people now in our communities that have never known what it was like wow. and how yeah. it can be. There are a large number of immigrants who have come in, not that they have anything wrong with immigration. However, those people are definitely going to go with the status quo and stay in, in Europe. I wonder. What I want to make sure is that the campaigners are going to address that question and say, get out there to convince those people, the young people, and the immigrant population, that they're going to. Uh, Yes. You know, I, I absolutely, I, take, I hear what you're saying, but I look around this audience, nice, and it's not just you, so I see lots of young, thrusting, uh, oh, dynamic, yeah. dynamic people in this audience. And it's very striking, actually, how many young people there are who are supporting our campaign. And you go, sorry, I'm not working. Now, I think mean, everybody, whatever their age, everybody understands the argument about democracy. That's what, fundamentally, that's what this is all about. And I find it resonates powerfully with people of all ages. That is the message we've got to get across. And our message, yeah. the yeah. difference yeah. in our message and the message of the Remainers is our message is fundamentally one of hope and belief in Britain. Yeah. And what young people want is a message of hope. Uh, on your seat, you've probably noticed them. 
Uh, there's some sign-up forms about volunteering. I'm the regional director for Yorkshire and Humber, uh, Tom Banks, and I am basically trying to get as many of you and as many people across Yorkshire to sign up to help out. We've got campaign teams in every parliamentary constituency, but we need more volunteers. There are lots of things you can do. If you can deliver some leaflets in your area, we'll give you them for free, as many as you can deliver. If you'd like to help with canvassing, that's knocking on doors to find out how people are voting, we can give you access to our database with a list of voters in your area. If you'd like to hold a street stall, we'll put you in touch with other people in your area and give you all the materials you need. And there are some simple ways you can help right now. As you might have noticed outside, we've got posters and car stickers. Please take some and put them up in your window, your garden, your car, all three. We want to show people how much support there is to vote leave and take back control. If you'd like to show your support in other ways, there's a table in the corner, as I'm sure you saw when you came in, where we're selling other merchandise. Mugs, umbrellas, mobile phone covers, you name it, we've got it from the, from the guys that sell us as much merchandise as possible. And we want to have a load of different things for people to show that they want to vote leave on the 23rd of June. So don't forget to hand in your volunteer card. There'll be people waiting outside, or you can leave them under your seat, and let us know how you can help. We can't win this referendum without people like you helping. But with your help, we will win and take back control for Britain. Thank you. taking out a lot of resources out of uh, British economy without actually the British getting more from uh, its membership of the EU.